Johnny, welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Andy. Great to be back. Thank you very much for having me. Literally kind of two years, almost to the day, since you were on the show, which feels like an awful long time. And for any of our listeners who haven't gone back as far as the early archives of the show, Johnny joined us back in July of 2021. And um, I guess the headline, <laughs> the, the, the clickbait of Johnny's podcast title was Stuntman Talks About His Portfolio or something like, like that. <laughs> And we had a little bit of a giggle about this, but Johnny, for, for any of our listeners who maybe haven't listened to that first episode, and I highly recommend that everybody does go back and listen to that, but just give everybody a bit of an update, who you are, what you're doing, whereabouts in the country you are. Well, firstly, thank you if you have taken the time to go and listen to my um, first podcast episode and you didn't just click on it because of the uh, title, I appreciate that. But um, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm Johnny, I live in uh, London and as you may have gathered from the previous uh, episode, I'm a professional stunt performer here in the UK, based out of the UK. But my passion project is HMOs, which I've been doing for the last uh, sort of five years now, I think it is, or maybe even six and I've been very well led by um, Mr. Andy Graham. He's helped me along the way. And um, <laughs> I'm still loving it, still doing it. And yeah, I'm still doing the day job as well. <laughs> <laughs> so your day job is quite literally jumping off things, um, acrobatic stuff literally getting a set on fire I remember the other day you were sat down and you're like got to go to work tomorrow and get set on fire <laughs> so the HMO stuff all this property stuff is is quite different isn't it it's very different yeah I mean I do a very physical job I will be honest I'm not getting set on fire or jumping off buildings every single time I go to work um, it has happened once or twice but uh yeah this is a very different kettle of fish really and this is um it's still all to Ironically, so, you know, all based around risk, really. So, yeah, there's a lot of risk with HMO investment, but there's a lot of risk with my day job as well. So, <laughs> We're going to get into all of this because we've got a very interesting episode planned for today. One that we've sort of been discussing for a while, and I think now is the right time to have this conversation. And I suppose, in a way, reveal some of the very real issues and challenges that investors like yourself are facing out there. And we're going to get into all of this, but um, before we do, what feels more risky? <laughs> the stunt performing or... <laughs> Or investing in HMOs? Uh, definitely stunt performing. <laughs> but like okay. really different types of risk, Andy. Uh, I think you're very aware of like your body and what you can do in the shelf life of that. Whereas hopefully with HMOs, time's with you a little bit with HMOs. It's a long game. So it's complete opposite in the sense that hopefully, you know, if we can keep investing for a, a long period of time, we can ride out the difficulties that we're going to discuss today over the long term, really. And um, hopefully... At the end of it, we'll have a really great um, business. So, yeah. So, Johnny, you're investing in central Liverpool, aren't you? And you're actually based a bit further south. So you're essentially, you are a remote investor, aren't you? Absolutely, yeah. Very much so, yeah. I'm based down in London and all of our investment properties are up in Liverpool and have been since since I started. And that was a, a strategic decision because obviously property investment returns and, and the values in, in London kind of made it unattractive yeah I, I couldn't really make the deals work in London so you know I was looking for an investment area live like like most people went for all the major cities you know student HMOs work well as we know in in those urban areas and uh came across Liverpool because I I met someone else that was investing there and he kind of teed me up to start investing in in that area so yeah it was really a conscious choice to find an area where the deals stack best but as uh, as we'll probably discuss in this podcast sort of when I first started investing to now the landscape has very much changed <laughs> um, up there and it's become a lot more challenging. We are we're going to talk about that and um, and I'm sure we'll touch on some of the challenges of of remote investing or perhaps more so the, the realities of, of remote investing <laughs> and a whole lot more so Johnny just for everyone's benefit then can you give us a bit of a like a high level, I suppose, summary or brief on on what your strategy actually is? The types of HMOs. I know they're all quite sort of consolidated. Yeah, basically, I very much focus on twelve roads in Liverpool in a very condensed area that's very close to the city centre, so students can walk to university, walk into town, walk to you know the major transport links. So it's a very close knit sort of few roads which 
when I first started investing wasn't under Article 4 direction. That was brought in in 2021 in the area. And so when I first started investing, we would buy tired houses of any in any condition, whether it not have been a, you know, a rental, someone's personal home or a student HMO. We buy them, we refurb them, heavy refurbs, and then we refinance them and put students in them. But uh, the strategies had to change slightly. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess we probably weren't really discussing the Article 4 stuff and the challenges that we're about to come on to today in the last episode. Because like you said, this, and it's quite unusual, Liverpool's a huge city, massive student population. So it was quite unusual that actually Liverpool didn't have an Article 4 direction up until quite recently. But I think it's safe to say, I mean, the only word I can describe you know, their their sort of a, approach to enforcing <laughs> the Article 4 direction. And I guess the suppression of HMOs, which is what it's all about, is they've kind of, they've been real bastards, haven't they? I mean, that, that is in essence what we're going to talk about today. It is, has been the challenges that they have to put in place for, for you as an investor, as, as, and, you know, and obviously other investors in Liverpool, have had to try and overcome just to continue investing. So... Let's go back a few years. We were buying more or less kind of anything that suited, had good options in terms of floor plans, was in the right location, uh, right price, obviously, and needed a bit of a refurb. So it's quite straightforward. Article 4 direction came in, and all of a sudden, it meant that you either had to get planning permission or you had to buy something that was existing as a HMO at that point. So it had the continuous use. And for most of our listeners, that shouldn't be unfamiliar the idea of sort of buying something you know with the grandfather rights but i think quite importantly what happened to you was that and, and other investors in liverpool was that the other stuff that you'd already bought that was going through development these heavy refurbs things like dormers extensions bits and pieces that had what we would believe to, to be permitted development rights all of a sudden they came into the firing line as well so just give us a bit of a, a kind of a, an outline of the types of challenges that we face, Johnny. And I think what we're going to do today is we're going to then sort of zoom in on a particular deal that actually that still really isn't completely tied up as a consequence of some of these yeah. issues. But what sort of issues have you been facing as a direct result of this Article 4 direction coming in? Well, to be honest, it, it kind of all started at the beginning so we as i mentioned before we started sort of late 2018 early 2019 investing and within about a, my first year i think i'd done my first deal we got wind that there was going to be article 4 coming into place in the liverpool area but we didn't really get an official statement from the local authority this was very much driven by newspapers and speculation the local newspapers have written about it, about it and so there was no real clarification. And despite myself and other sort of investors trying to get clarity from the local authority about whether or not it was coming, you, you were never really, they would never really respond to you. So they, from, from the get go, and I think this is a common theme that we'll talk about today that's gone all the way through this journey, is this constant lack of clarity around what is and isn't. In Liverpool um, so you know we know very much what article 4 is and the impl implications of it but the local authority has never been particularly clear about you know what we can and, and cannot do and have quite often not understood the rules themselves um, but then try to enforce them in the way they think they should be enforced when actually they're wrong in what they're trying to sort of put upon you and, and your developments so yeah, that's a real shocker. So <laughs> it's made it made it really really difficult. And when you say that they were getting stuff wrong, I guess a lot of what we're talking about here is, I guess, legislation that's actually from a national level. You know, you introduced an Article Four direction, which they needed permission for from the Secretary of State. Not surprising that they were given that because some degree of control you know, is probably beneficial for any sort of highly populated area. So not unusual, but. You know, what they can and can't do within that you know, should be pretty black and white. And I think what's probably useful for our listeners as well is to give a little bit more context about this particular council because 
they had, and correct me if I'm wrong, Johnny, but some pretty deep-rooted issues right sort of down to ground level. And I think so much so that the government had to kind of step in to the local council and kind of intervene because they were having such issues. Is that Have I remembered that right? right just kind of yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, no, you haven't. No, they were under special measures due to the a mayor that was that was in charge at the time was sort of doing underhand deals to get purpose-built student accommodation built in the city centre. Um, so he had taken a lot of backhanded deals. I believe he's gone to prison for that now and might still be in prison. But uh, it meant that the, you know, the Westminster went up there and put the local authority under, under special measures and uh, took over most of the departments, not just, just planning. But despite this, you would hope this would have sort of had a, some sort of dramatic effect that meant they got their ducks in a row and, you know, would get hold of this Article 4 that they're implementing. But to be perfectly frank and honest, it's not really helped anything, Andy. They've they've continued to sort of drag their heels and it's all still quite a mess, even, you know, here we are today in 2023, sort of two years later. So this council is probably quite an extreme example of of how challenging it can be to work with planning departments but i know for a lot of our listeners and i see these sort of questions and concerns in our community all the time planning you know per se is just quite difficult quite challenging to navigate i've always and quite publicly said look if you don't have to ask for something don't a good example would be a certificate of lawfulness a lot of people like to have them in their back pocket go to the council make an application and this sort of whole can of worms is opened up and i think what i hope we can sort of demonstrate through today's episode is that actually even though things are supposed to be done in a particular way or for a particular reason it would be wise of us as investors to to understand that the council is very rarely on our side and in fact often so it seems very much sitting on the other side of, of the fence you know they're, they're actually quite strongly opposed to what we're doing and we need to be quite careful there because i think the way that we approach applications um the way that we um sort of think about about what we're doing and where we invest money and who we employ to kind of help us do it i think it's all really quite important but again a lot of this should come out in the wash through today's episode so let's talk first and foremost about how your strategy immediately kind of changed as a result of the the article 4 direction coming in all of a sudden, wasn't the ability to just buy anything we wanted, so we had to buy stuff that needed planning or, or had continuous use. So what have you focused on there, Johnny, in terms of since it came in, what sort of stuff for our listeners' benefits have you actually been buying? Yeah, very much changed the focus from, you know, where I had the beauty of just being able to purchase anything, very much had to look for those HM, pre-existing HMOs in the area and try and, you know, buy up what I could of those which initially was a bit of a mess because a lot of agents didn't quite understand Article 4 in the area. Bear in mind, it's obviously new to Liverpool at the time it came in. So they would sort of tell you it's Article 4 compliant and quite often it wasn't, you know, there wouldn't have been the ASTs or they're unable to produce them. Um, I even had one agent ask me if Article 4 was a surveillance system when I rang up to inquire about our properties. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, it had quite <laughs> quite a few sort of uh, queries. And basically, I found myself, you know, fortunately, I, my initial reaction was to try and educate myself and understand Article 4 through people that knew knew about it, yourself and a planning consultant, but I found myself then educating people and estate agents and vendors that I'm buying off because they just literally didn't have a clue and the local authority just wouldn't give them any information. So it was made the whole market become this sort of frenzied atmosphere of no one really knowing where the guidelines are and what you can and can't do. So all you could go off is what, what other Article 4 directives do in other areas of the UK and use that information to try and then make informed decisions as to what's best for you in your area. Um, and that's kind of how we approach the, the situation. Um, not unusual that you know, if we needed to get certain clarifications, we, we would probably want to understand 
the council's opinion, let's say, for, for example, if we wanted to get a certificate of lawfulness, maybe to satisfy a lender or maybe just to satisfy ourselves. But this particular council were really quite uh, obstructive in terms of sort of explaining what they would want, quite literally, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Johnny, but quite literally just which would not respond to any form of communication. So it, it sort of made it a bit of a guessing game. Well, I don't quite know what this council is going to be satisfied with. Good example would be, usually, if you can provide evidence that there was continuous use, maybe there's a couple of gaps here and there. Um, let's say there was a year where it didn't rent because the property was in a poor condition and then the property was sold. There are going to be some gaps. Maybe one or two tenancies are just missing over, like, a, let's say, a 10-year time. Usually, a sensible approach would be to look at the information provided, look at the evidence and say, look, yeah, clearly it has been predominantly used, you know, continuously for this. It's highly likely that the gaps, you know, are, are legitimate. Um, the intention was clearly to continue using it uh, as a HMO if and when we can see that it was vacant for any reason, let's say because it was being refurbished or sold. And, um, you yeah, they would grant a certificate of lawfulness. But... Uh, in some cases, in, in case this this council, you know, they just didn't really want to play ball whatsoever with these sorts of requests. So it became quite difficult to know whether or not we should or shouldn't buy stuff. And of course, there's licensing that needs to be satisfied. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Liverpool ask for evidence of the sort of appropriate planning use now, Johnny, in their in their license applications, do they? Yeah, yeah, they do. They they do, but. Again, you know, licensing is separate from planning. I think that's such a murky water, which, you know, I certainly made that mistake yeah. when I was trying to understand Article 4 and the council, the people working in the council seem to think, you know, they relate to each other and, you know, you need you need that certificate of lawfulness to get a HMO licence, which, you know, as we know, is, is not correct. But this council obviously seemed to use licensing and, and that almost barrier to entry that gate as a way of making it very difficult for a number of landlords, owners of existing HMOs even, to progress license applications without going back through the council to get something like a certificate of lawfulness or of sort of the appropriate evidence. And then of course, when you went to the council, it was impossible to get it because they just wouldn't engage in the conversation. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. it was difficult to know from where we were sat, but it, it very much looked like it wasn't just incompetence and i want to be careful what i say here because mm. look you know there's two sides to every conversation right but this is certainly what we seem to experience it wasn't just incompetence it, it seemed to be quite an intentional very direct approach to throw a spanner in the works for hmo investors and owners of you know, particularly student properties so look, aside from buying new stuff and trying to get permission or, or at least sort of evidence for compliance Let's talk a little bit about some of the issues we've had with the permitted development, right? And kind of how all of the Article 4 you know, introduction then clouded everything else. And certainly from the council's perspective, again, all of a sudden wasn't permitted and, and became a bit of an issue for you. Tell us about some of those challenges we've had. Yeah, I mean, very much so. I mean, quite, you know, obviously we we just, um, chose to purchase C4 properties, um, so pre-existing HMOs. So we're making sure we're ticking that box. Um, and then when it came to the development side of things, the area we strictly invest in is a conservation area, but they would quite often say that you, because of that, you don't get permitted development. But the most important part was the conservation actually only related to the front facades of the properties. And obviously all our development was was at the rear of the property. So quite often they would sort of say, you know, it, it has to be in a certain style or you can't build a dormer because basically you're in this conservation area. So they, they kind of feels like they kind of manipulate the legislation a little bit to what, what they want to sort of just in every which way refuse you. And you would end up getting in this sort of battle of of conversation with a planning officer and it would go backward and forward and then eventually you know they would maybe concede and then they would send you down off on another tangent of like you know what roof lights can go into the property or what you can do in terms of your size your dormer or something like that so it was this constant like kind of change of tech like keep you busy kind of talking backwards and forwards going down one rabbit hole of of conversation about a roof light and then the next thing it would be like they would back they would go on to another subject and this just prolonged like it will still does prolong every planning application 
which should take eight weeks to months and months and months of work. You had to start separating certain elements of your planning applications, didn't you? You sort of had to separate, I think, just like adding an extension or adding a dormer from the addition of, of bedrooms or maybe even sort of triggering the question, do you have permission to use this as a HMO? Because they, they were so difficult. Like it was in, in some cases, you know, every house or every other house on the on the street had a rear dormer. And so clearly the precedence was set and you weren't doing anything different and you were following, proposing to follow, you know, all of the regs but they would block the application on these other points that they would find, wouldn't they? Which would be to do with, you know, completely technically unrelated matters. Yeah, I mean, one particular road we were on, I think there was 80 houses of which I think there's 57 dormers existing on that road and they refused us <laughs> a dormer. Um, so then we removed the dormer um, as the local authority guided us. And then they went on about the roof lights instead and pushed us on that. So then we said we'll keep them in keeping with the conservation area. And then the roof lights weren't satisfactory. And it was to do with the sort of ground floor extension and the bricks used for the ground floor extension. And this went, you know, would go on and on and on. And more often what eventually happens is we just go for non-determination because you can't actually get an answer from the council. So it'll take a year for them to come up yeah. with a response and then you're forced to basically go for non-determination so let's talk about this because i think for a lot of listeners um, and certainly some of our listeners are perhaps less experienced when it comes to planning applications there is a process there's a statutory process it's outlined you know you should be able to submit an application there's a way that things are done there's a timeline that things should be addressed and there's a process but when you were submitting things often it was the case that you would submit and in, in some cases, Johnny, you just wouldn't even get acknowledgement that your planning application had been received, right? Yeah, so, I mean, we, we're going to talk about a case study, but sort of like another one that's like quite pertinent and sort of is a real example of, you know, the whole challenge was property on Empress Road we did, which, so we sort of purchased it in September of 2019, which came with students in the property so, you know, already C4, this is way pre, pre Article 4 coming in. It didn't come in until June 2021. Um, on the 21st of April of 2021, we decided to submit a planning application because um, we wanted to do an extension at the back. Submitted the application along with all our evidence, including a statutory declaration, which is where I went to a solicitor and swore an oath that Basically, you know, this is a C, you know, these ASTs are true to my knowledge and, you know, I've managed the property for however many years and I've always had, you know, it, used it as a HMO and it was completely sort of ignored. It just, and for weeks, you know, we would send follow-up emails, we'd pay the fees, we'd send up follow-up emails saying, you know, have you got our application? And we just wouldn't get any response whatsoever. And we actually took us 11 months before we start could get to appeal with that property so it was it was 11 months of back and forward with the local planning authority before we even got to appeal with the inspectorate on the 31st of march in 2022 it's almost difficult to believe isn't it that how could they possibly do this but th this is what they were and, and have been doing and obviously we sound like bitter investors you know you can you can almost see the headlines now can't you you know frustrated investors moaning about you know council slow planning department but the reality is the implications of just ignoring you know your submissions for, for planning applications and things like this it means that it's it's costing you an awful lot of money to sit on this property wondering what can i do when can i start what do i do with the builders um or, you know, obviously we'll come on to it, but we're going to talk a little bit about we just had to make some decisions and get on with certain amounts of work because we physically you know, just couldn't tolerate sitting there and doing absolutely nothing while we waited for the council. So we took a position, didn't we? And we got on with various elements. But of course, then, you know, there was a gamble because when they came up for refinance, the likelihood was that we were going to be asked questions about planning permissions and certain mm. certain things that we had and and, uh, and of course you know while the council is just not playing you know with a straight back you know it made it very 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 difficult so tell us a little bit more about this particular case study then this this one that that has had a number of challenges uh yeah so the one i was just discussing sort of went on until the uh, finally we got an in inspection on the 11th of july 2022 and then the that's from the national planning inspectorate 
and then eventually we got planning permission on the 6th of October in 2022. So basically that was an 18-month process to go from, you know, getting the planning approved. And bear in mind, as you've just sort of said, that whole time you have to make decisions. Obviously, it's a C4 property. The options are you sit there with a property completely empty, um, which is frustrating as an investor. But I think what I found more frustrating with that process is we quite often with the local um, student bodies, um, they will contact us about uh, we've got a couple that are doing a PhD that need accommodation for themselves in the area and two children. Uh, do you have a house? I had a house sat there that I couldn't push. I didn't want to, you know, I'd miss the student cycle by sitting there with an empty house. If I put that family in, it loses its C4 status. So it goes back to C3. So basically the choices are, you know, sit there with an empty house while the whole time Article 4 is there to try and stem the flow of HMOs and increase the housing supply. I could put someone in there and home them, but I can't because I'll lose my C4 status. So we then took the really hard decision on that particular project to be like, right, well, let's just go ahead and build um, without planning permission, which is quite, you know, probably to most people sounds mad, but... Um, we were kind of left without, with no choice. It was either going to be that or sit there for another year or so and, and, and just be empty for another year. Um, so yeah, we took the, took the decision to build. This was, this was something we discussed a lot and we weighed up all of the pros and cons. It was a very sort of informed decision with risk. You know, the risk was obviously that you ultimately didn't get planning. And I think that this is a really important part to talk about today because this is very unusual and certainly on the show and it's and it's obviously not the sort of advice that we you know would would recommend you know don't get planning permission first and then do the work but in this circumstance you know it just almost just didn't allow it and the risk of the risk of just sitting there was was almost greater but there was also a certain degree of confidence that we had that we were ultimately going to get it and I think kudos to you, Johnny, because I mean you've got a good mentor, <laughs> but <laughs> He's you, <a> right, yeah. <laughs> you, you ultimately, ultimately, the, you know the responsibility and the costs were going to fall back on you, and and this was a decision you had to make mm. with my support. And a lot of people, you know, obviously, you know, and understandably wouldn't wouldn't want to do that and would want to wait, and that would be perfectly fine, and you know, and completely understand and sympathise with that, but. We were really, really, really strategic, weren't we, about the way that we began to approach all of these applications and everything that you were doing with HMOs. And I think that you touched on it already, really boiled down to, first of all, fundamentally understanding what the Article 4 direction is, you know, what the conservation policy is, what you technically should and, and shouldn't be able to do. And then also, I think one of the, one of the best moves we made was to employ a planning consultant, a friend of mine, someone I've done with, you know, a lot of work with, um, that I knew um, had a very, very, very special interest in HMOs and would really kind of enjoy getting their teeth into into this. And um, obviously, there's been been a lot of work there for them. Yeah. But would you say that you know that has been a critical part of actually all, kind of getting to where we we have got, which is by no means like we've we've got through everything we're still wading through a lot of rubbish with the council but you know we've got some of them through we've almost now got the proof of concept how important do you think it was to to get that strategy in place and to get the right people to help you johnny yeah it's absolutely invaluable i couldn't have done it without you know the likes of yourself and and the planning consultant involved because i, I wouldn't have had the confidence to take these risks i mean we had private finance involved in the deal for the refurb. It's not just my own money, you know, it's an investor's money. So I've got to make sure, you know, the, the risks are minimal. So just having the right people around you to sort of guide you, tell you what you can and can't do. And, you know, just being able to discuss the risk. You know, we all knew it was going to be a risk. There's no, you know, I don't think there's any investment that doesn't come without risk, but trying to proportion that risk and know, you know where we stand and that you know these are the consequences if this ha if this doesn't work this is the consequences if this works then you know great we, we got through it and then you know ultimately the decision's mine to always to to pull the trigger and go for it but I just not having the right people around me just gave me that confidence to sort of do it and you know as we'll probably discuss you know again 
I've got another one right now that's in exactly the same position. You know, we've done the refurb and we still don't have, and we've got tenants in there, but we still don't have the planning granted because it's in an appeal and has been for for a year now. So, yeah. It sounds so bizarre sort of saying that we've done work, we've, you know, we've kind of had to get it up and running, but we haven't got planning yet. And and I think just, just to kind of really reiterate, this is a council that are not just a bit slow. Um, this is not that you have in any way applied for anything contentious this is very sort of black and white bread and butter stuff that should be very very easy and straightforward to deal with and the precedent is set i mean in some examples you've said you know, almost 60 percent of the housing stock on the same street has already done it which pretty much means you can do it you know yeah. rear dormant you can do it rear extension ground floor up to a certain distance you know within a certain distance from the boundary you can do it but this council the way that I have always thought about this is a little bit like, I can't remember what film it was. I think it was, um, is it Big Daddy with Adam Sandler? But there's some people rollerblading and they, you know, out in like probably Central Park and, and someone throws sticks in front of the rollerbladers and they're coming down this hill and they don't see the sticks and everyone just starts to go flying. And, and it's it's quite funny for the people throwing sticks. And I, I sort of very much feel like this is just what the council do. And maybe I'm cynical, but, mm. but I don't think for one second that, what this particular council have done in trying to stem the flow of HMOs or just make lives difficult for HMO investors and owners in, in any way, shape and form ha has been very, very intentional. And um, I'm going to you know, stick my neck out and say that because that is absolutely how it seems. There are too many things and too many consistent features of um, their inconsistencies to me that, that kind of just say it can be anything but quite an intentional approach to targeting HMO landlords. I mean, I guess time will tell, but obviously this article for direction hasn't been in that long. And you may even be the first person that's, you know, successfully appealed to one of these things and maybe you know, started to, to turn the dial a little bit. I think I am actually. Who knows though? I mean, yeah, yeah, who knows? Uh, um, I think, yeah, having sort of, I know a few sort of local investors um, and I keep an eye on the planning applications that go in and uh you know i feel like at the moment we're sort of a bit of a trailblazer in the area in terms of we are the ones that are that are getting the planning and and you know using a consultant to appeal these and, and ultimately winning these decisions and a lot of people have kind of seemed to get two types of sort of investor in which they've just given up and they're selling up properties or they're just doing it without the planning which to me you know we talked about risk before and that that never would sit right with me you know to to sort of put in and to try and do a development without planning in the area so um i'm you know i can sleep well at night mm. that i'm doing the right thing um which is really important um but yeah i do feel like we are sort of leading the way in in, in our air investment area for for these applications yeah and, and hopefully the council starts to recognize that now that the independent inspectorates come and sort of said, well, you know, there's no reason that you can't or shouldn't have granted the award for planning permission. Then you know, it, it makes them less reluctant to continue making the life so difficult for other investors and, and other people trying to do similar, similar things. But again, just to reiterate for all of our listeners, this episode is not in any way, shape or form encouraging anybody to go and do anything without planning permission. What we wanted to do today, what I certainly wanted to do today was just highlight how challenging it can be in certain areas with certain councils, with certain sort of um, planning applications. However, you have still, despite these huge challenges, Johnny, um, you, you know, you've still been managing to wade through it and make it work. And that brings me on to the next question I've got for you, which I'm sure is at the tip of everybody's tongue listening right now, which is, if it was so difficult, why on earth have you continued? <laughs> why not just go and invest somewhere else? Why not invest outside of the Article 4 direction? Why not invest in different types of properties? Yeah, I think it's, it's a really valid question, and I do get asked this a lot. Um, there's not one sort of straight answer with it, really. It's a multitude of answers. But, you know, hopefully by doing this and going through this and <clears throat> challenging the planning or the local authority and you know winning these planning appeals we are sort of we're we're putting ourselves into a really strong position in the area in which we can sort of invest and we've that article 4 does sort of protect your investment and i do think article 4 is a positive thing for these cities and for hmos i'm not against article 4 
if it is implemented properly. Um, so yeah, I didn't want to just turn my back on it. I felt like we could, if we could overcome this, we've got a bit of a golden goose in the sense that if we can win these appeals, then hopefully we can protect our investment long term. And also it's sort of, I think from getting the advice from yourself and others, we just decided to pivot the strategy, which meant we just had to structure what we're doing very differently. And it's really no different to what you'd be doing in an area where you put in a planning application, you got a response in eight weeks from your local planning authority. But now we just have to extend the sort of timeframes and structure the business in such a way that every deal is done in a sort of chronological order. So we, and we know the timeframes we're working to. Um, and so that's why, really, we haven't run run away from Liverpool as an area. Also, I've got a great, just to to put sort of a shout out, out there, I've got a great team of people up there that I've spent time building relationships with pre-Article 4. And I, didn't, I just felt like I would never get those sort of people um, again in another city. It may sound cynical, but I just built really good relationships with them and I didn't really want to lose them. And a lot of the people I work with, you know, they were reliant on us as a business and they had worked for us for a long time and, you know, we'd employed them and I didn't want to just leave them sort of without work. So I really wanted to make it work in Liverpool. Um, I was passionate about that and that's why I've stuck with the area. I think it's great to hear you say that and say it in that way, Johnny, because the easy thing would have been to, to walk away, to go and invest somewhere else, just, you know, just put all that effort and work into this area that, you, that you'd already you know, invested aside and and go and learn something new and 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 try and build a different power team elsewhere Mm. but i do think and i agree with you i think article four directions so long as they're implemented in the right way and and it's all sort of fair and above board i think they are a good thing i think they do protect your investment i think they do give you you know if you opened a restaurant on a shop and the council you know said well we'll let you do it but we're going to limit the number of other restaurants that we can open you know, that's good for business. You're going to say, great, thanks very much. I'll take that. Yes, you're going to pay a little bit more to get in. But once you're in, it's mm. really, really valuable to have that compliance. And for me, that's why I continue to buy in prime locations, even though, as I've said many times on the podcast, I don't get the very best returns. I don't get the 50, 100% return on my capital employed in any of my HMO deals whatsoever. But what I do get is a really strong rental yield. I get incredibly solid rental confidence year after year i get good rental appreciation the banks love it it's very lendable and it just works and as you've done it's easy to then build a consolidated portfolio where you have one point of contact who's your maintenance man one builder to do all of your projects you've got one set of regulations and and local sort of hmo amenity standards that you need to know and understand and just make sure are right so I think you've done the right thing despite how hard and how challenging it's been. And now I think you're really going to sort of see kind of the benefits of that moving forwards as, as hopefully the council, well, you've at least got the proof of concept that you can do these things that you, you will ultimately win at appeal. And hopefully the council begins to take a softer approach to this stuff. I can't expect that's going to happen quickly, but I think looking ahead another five years, I think your portfolio is going to be a really, really, really valuable portfolio, prime location with all of the compliance eventually. (laughs) Um, And a lot of people will have just been turning their backs on this market for the exact reasons that, you know, we've been talking about today. So kudos to you, Johnny. I think um, you are a trailblazer. Um, You quite literally set yourself on fire in the day and you're doing (laughs) it for us HMO investors as well, (laughs) taking on the planning system. (laughs) Um, Johnny. Yes. You've obviously had to take, and I think, I'm sure you won't mind me discussing this, you and I, we've worked together for a long time, love every session, we catch up every couple of weeks, and we're very similar in in many ways, one being that we're both quite impatient, Mm -hmm. and we openly talk about how impatient we are and how frustrating this is, and planning is is just about the most frustrating thing, you know, and if you're impatient, (laughs) it really does take its toll. You know, how have you managed that on a personal level and you, you've alluded to changing your strategy and pivoting a little bit but how have you had to approach your your overall strategy and the way that you invest and your, your outlook on the business with this in mind yeah um i've really had to learn sort of on a personal level to sort of deal with with this sort of always hanging over me i very much you know as you alluded to, very impatient. <laughs> I want everything done sort of yesterday. And so the sort of strategy now in order to sort of, 
I think help me deal with it on a personal level, but also for the business to sort of continue to to grow in the right direction is, you know, we have to look sort of 24 months ahead. So when I'm purchasing a property, I know that, you know, if we get that, that sale agreed until I will get tenants through the door, it's probably going to be the best part of 24 months. Main reason mm-hmm. being, you know, four to six months for the purchase. And then we've got a year's planning that we'll have to, we'll know it will go to, we won't get it through with local planning authority. It will have to go to the inspectorate and they'll have to do a site visit and then they'll have to give us their decision, which all of that whole process is usually a year long, if not longer. And then, you know, then we can refurb, which is sort of six months. Um, we do very heavy refurbs. So we're looking at a six month period for that. And then you can get your, your tenants in. And then obviously I'm investing with students. So quite often we might miss the student cycle. We've got no control over that. So we have to look at sort of temporarily housing sort of young professionals in the, in the meantime, which we've done in the past. So just sort of like pivoting on the strategy a little bit, I would call it mm-hmm. sort of having a long term view and just making sure, you know, why we've got we've we've always got a project going on we've got something one or two in planning or whatever and then we've got a project being going through conveyancing that's kind of how i like to keep the sort of plate spinning so i know that there's always you know there's always enough going on and we're we, it feels like you're still moving forward even though it's a incredibly slow play, pace compared to a lot of other people and that's sort of how we we sort of deal yeah. with it these days well, thank you for being so honest and knowing your business and you so well. I think that that is a really great, great summary of how you've adjusted. And, and actually, I would say on the long term view that you know, you've have had to take. Yes, each project, we're kind of thinking more like a 24 month timeline. But actually, one of the big changes, big shifts I've seen in you is that you've allowed yourself to think much longer term with the overall and with the much sort of broader business plan and I think that that's been really important because with that we've been able to see actually what this looks like in five years what this looks like in 10 years and then it starts to get really really exciting and I know that that for a lot of people that is quite difficult to get excited mm. about something that might happen in five or ten years but property is a slow game I think this episode you know has demonstrated that probably more than than any and it's not always like this and not every project has been or is like that for you as well but I think having that long-term view and being prepared to solve these problems and I think that sometimes the bigger the problem the bigger the gain and I think your portfolio now as these you know permissions start to come through and your portfolio is really starting to work for you is going to be an incredibly valuable one and I'm really really excited for you and kind of to see what this looks like in another five five years time but um Johnny thank you so much for coming on the show today for anyone who's been listening today maybe looking for some investment opportunities looking for somebody that they might be able to team up with uh, maybe just looking for a bit of advice in and around Liverpool is there a way that they can contact you yeah um so we're on social media we're on Instagram at Crockwell Properties and uh, you can always drop me an email if you want to speak to me direct if you send it to info at crockwellproperties.co.uk um someone will pick that up myself or um one of the team and um yeah I can get back to you and I'd love to I love the process something you've taught me Andy so I'm always happy to talk about my uh, planning woes and uh, HMOs <laughs> anytime so yeah just um get in touch I'd love to hear from you great thanks Johnny well it's been a real pleasure having you back on the show a lot has changed in, in the last two years and um you know I'm quite looking forward to getting you on the show again to see where we're at in a year or so's time. And hopefully you are that trailblazer, you're that talisman that we're all looking up to. And um, yeah, you know, I really hope to kind of to see that, you know, things start to change on a local level. And um, I guess thank you to you for all of the, the hard work and in many ways sacrifice that you've had to make on behalf of us, us investors in in your local area. But um, thank you, Johnny, for sharing this story and being so honest with us, because I think, you know, I've always on the show wanted to be open and transparent with our listeners. And um, sometimes it's easy uh, and sometimes it's hard and um, sometimes a lot of people, you know, just are unfamiliar with what is often happening behind the scenes. And I think episodes like this are great to just really show people what it can be like to help people get prepared, to make informed decisions, to um, sort of manage expectations. So thank you for coming on and sharing all of this with us, Johnny. 
Grail, thanks for having me, Andy.